Hey kids, welcome for our Sunday devotion today. And we're the fifth Sunday in Lent, and it's already the beginning of April, which is kind of crazy because that means that we've just got a couple more weeks and then we get to celebrate again how Jesus died for us on Good Friday. That's on the 15th. And then how Jesus rested in the tomb on the Saturday and then rose again from the dead, all in order to take our, you know, our humanity, our broken humanity, and to raise it up to new life and forgive our sins. And that's, that's a wonderful theme and that message that we have throughout throughout all of the ages ever since Jesus came, so that that's what we preach and that's what we build our hope on. Today we're going to read from Luke's Gospel again, and Luke chapter 20, five chapters later. And just like last week, Jesus sometimes liked to use stories in order to tell and, and teach people. And sometimes we don't do it enough because sometimes teaching people with stories is a cool thing to do. But as we listen, Jesus was being faced by some of the religious leaders who kept saying that they had the better understanding than what he had about what God wanted from us and how God was going to save us. And then he told them this parable, this story, in order to kind of catch them and say, but just wait a minute, you know, you guys aren't really listening. You need to listen. So here, let's begin. Where Luke writes, Jesus began to tell the people this parable. Okay, a man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. And when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This is also they, they, they wounded and they cast out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and will give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the other chief priests sought to lay their hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. And so they watched him and sent spies and, to, and who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and the jurisdiction of the governor." This is the word of the Lord, and we say, Amen. You know, as we listen to that last part about the scribes and the chief priests, and those are different kinds of religious leaders during the time of Jesus' day, well, they really didn't like Jesus because all of the things that they had built their ideas around and what it meant to be a good, good person within, uh, within God's eyes, Jesus came and said, that's not it, you misunderstood that God is love and he's not so much worried about well, how perfect we are because he realizes and he knows that we can't be perfect and that's why he promised to send me in order to come and to be that savior. But as people heard that, they really didn't like what Jesus said because they always thought that you know their job was to make sure everyone was doing all the right things. And it's not to say that doing the right things is wrong, you know, it's good to do that because that's a good way to care for our neighbors. But you know, when we think that it's by all the good stuff that we do that we get into heaven, then we miss the, miss the whole message of the Bible and the whole reason why Jesus came. Jesus came in order to be the one who died, just like the son of that, that owner of the vineyard, but in order to be the cornerstone, the way that Jesus uses that verse from the Old Testament from Isaiah, in order to say, and what are, what's a cornerstone? We don't always know what those things are. Next time you come into church, though, watch as you're coming in the front door because there's a cornerstone. There's actually two. And they have dates on them. The first cornerstone is from when the church was built in 1969. And then the second cornerstone is when we added on that whole section with the big room on the side where my study is and the secretary's office. And we have, we have that big whiteboard in there where we have the coffee pot and all those sorts of things. And so we have two cornerstones. But usually... You know, 
nowadays when we think of building a house we don't think about stones anymore because we use cement and all these kinds of things well for many many generations and even if you go driving in the countryside sometimes you see houses that are built out of rocks that were collected from the fields and that was true in many parts of the world and especially around well the, the country of israel where jesus lived where what people would do when they built a house they didn't have cement back then what they would do instead is they would cut one stone and try to make it as square and you know proper dimensions as possible and then they would place that stone and that stone would be the stone where they added all the other rocks to in order to build the house and if that stone was crooked well the house would be crooked but if the stone was straight the house would be straight here jesus is comparing himself to that cornerstone and he's saying that the people that rejected the cornerstone, basically, they're the ones that basically build things on a crooked kind of a way and the whole house falls down. <coughs> but with Jesus as the cornerstone, who did all things perfectly for you and for me. You know, we might get crushed a little, but we might, not, we might get broken a little bit as we realize our own brokenness as we come to Jesus, is what he's saying there. But we won't get crushed because God sent his son, Jesus, to save us. And then the way in which the church is described later on by Peter. Remember Peter the Apostle. He says we're a house built from living stones that are built upon Jesus as the cornerstone. All of these things come together where Jesus is pointing out that, you know, he came in order to set our lives right, not only with God, but then also to guide us and shape us so that we would learn to live properly, showing that love and that forgiveness and humility to everybody. And those are hard things to remember, I know. Everybody, including moms and dads and even the pastor, me, um, or Pastor Oboya, we all stumble in those areas. Every pastor does, and every parent does, and every adult does. And that means that each and every person, including you, stumbles in those areas. But the wonderful thing is, is that the Father, where Jesus talks about him as the owner of the vineyard, who sent all of those servants in order to come. That's the prophets in the Old Testament, and then we can talk about the apostles in the New Testament, to point us to Jesus, who comes to make our lives right all through his forgiveness. As so we get to celebrate not only how Jesus died for us, but then rose again, we see the way in which God, God is the one that, you know, clears away all of our sins and forgives us and does what is necessary, needed in order for us to get into heaven. And that's the gift that Jesus gives to us. when We celebrate not only baptism, Holy Communion, why we gather in church so that part of my job as a pastor is not only to preach God's word, to tell us how we ought to live, but then as we discover how we, well, we all mess up, that God's love and forgiveness is there. That's my job when, at the beginning, when we confess our sins, we'll come before God and say, you know what? My life is broken, and it's my job, it's my joy, not only to announce to the whole congregation, but even to each and every one of you. And if we need to do it privately too, if there's something that really is bugging you, I can do that as well. Same is true for moms and dads, they can do that too. So that we build on Jesus, who is the one who is our cornerstone. Just like today, the scribes and the chief priests back then, today there's lots of people that try to get, well, try to find things to complain about. In the way that back then it talked about how the scribes and chief priests, they wanted to find something that Jesus said so that they could hand him over to have him killed. And it fulfilled exactly what Jesus was talking about there. Where Jesus was letting the disciples know and everyone else who was listening that he had come and he was going to die. But at the same time, even when he died, he would be the one that would become the savior of the world. He already was. And this is what we get to celebrate again in a couple of weeks' time. All right. I hope to see all of you in church over the next little while because that's an exciting and wonderful gift that God gives. And as we look forward to that, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you came as that son, that son from our heavenly father who came not only to gather together your whole church 
from all of the people in the world back then, but even today, so that you call us by that same gift of forgiveness. Help us to grow in connection to that, so that it's not only something that we remember or think about every so often, but that we celebrate and practice every weekend as we come to church in order to not only confess our sins to be forgiven, but then hear your teaching from your word. And then as we get old enough in order to go through confirmation classes, we prepare to receive that gift, the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Jesus, in order to save us and forgive us. Help us to grow into all of those things so that you would keep us always hugged tightly in your arms. But bless us throughout this season of Lent so that as we get ready in a couple of weeks' time to celebrate and hear again that whole account about Jesus dying on the cross, that our ears would be open, that our hearts would be ready to receive that word and that gift so that we can sing your praises again on Easter morning for that beautiful gift. Bless us today. Bless mom and dad. Bless all of those around us, our families, our brothers and sisters. And keep us all safe. All of these things we pray for in the name of Jesus. And we say, Amen. We'll see you soon.